In this video, I'm going to show you how to insert your project into an aerial photo taken from a drone and make your design feel right in place in the real site location. Hey guys, uh, so after I presented my final thesis project, you guys got really interested on the aerial image that I created for that presentation and I got loads of messages asking me how I did it. This video is the workflow that I used and currently use. There are many other methods out there, so watch this tutorial knowing that you should try to adapt to your design and drone photo and programs you know how to use, alright? Uh, we've covered already how to use a drone photo as a background image here on YouTube. You can watch this other video later if you haven't seen it already. But today, we're gonna learn how to match the perspective lines to place the design right in the site and make it look like part of the location. We're gonna focus on the placement workflow, which I feel is the most valuable thing you can take out of this video. Now, this project is the same one used in the Isometric Diagrams Masterclass. Uh, the design is from Amanda Shiketo, and all the important info about her and the project will be in the video description, as always. If you enjoyed this type of content, then don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on future videos. And now without further ado, let's begin. For this video, as I said, I'm gonna use the final thesis from Amanda. Now, she provided the model for the Isometric Diagrams Masterclass, and since I needed a project to insert in a real site location where I could physically take a drone photo, this would be a good example to teach you this workflow. So a colleague of mine took this drone photo. I simply cropped the image because I wanted to focus more on the entrance itself. So that's the first step. Take an aerial photo from your site. For these insertions, uh, usually the best camera position is to be somewhat close to 45 degrees looking downwards. But as with the other example that I showed you before on my final thesis, this can work with many different camera angles. My suggestion now is to have the person who's taking the drone shots for you take as many angles as she or he possibly can so that later you have more freedom to choose which image to work with. It's better to have something in mind beforehand so that you know more or less what type of photos you will need. But the way you create the image and the final outcome can change during this process. All right, now the second step is to match your 3D to the drone photo. Uh, I'm going to use SketchUp for that. It has a pretty easy tool called Match Photo, but certainly other 3D software have similar capabilities. You just need to make sure that you have a tool that changes the perspective lines based on the photo you insert. Uh, it's a manual work though. I want to emphasize that it's not a single software that will get you a decent final result. You, it's how you use it and how you manipulate the assets in various ways to achieve the final image. So adapt the steps as you go, but keep the workflow in mind. So in SketchUp, start from a similar point of view that will make things easier down the road. Then you go to Camera and Match New Photo. I'll select the photo you picked from all the drone footage you received and hit Open. It looks like it's gonna be difficult and it's all messy, but bear with me here. As you're gonna see, it's quite easy. Your goal is to match the perspective lines from the 3D to the photo using those green and red guides that have appeared. That's why I mentioned that an angled camera view would work better, because we can clearly see the lines converging to the vanishing points here, right? Now try to space the lines apart. This is a trial and error type of tool. Uh, it's hard for me to say how you should place the lines because each image will be different. Just make sure that you're placing the lines in different vanishing points. Once they look okay, you might already get a correct result on your screen. If that isn't the case, like mine here, you've got to move the origin of your model to the correct position using this little yellow square here. And there you have it. It looks good and the perspective is matching up pretty close. As you can see, the building is still a bit small. 
uh, to scale against the photo, use either the green, red or blue opaque lines to scale it up or down. If you hover your mouse on these lines, you will see your cursor changing, saying that you can zoom in or out, uh, therefore scaling the model. Now listen up, uh, this step is really hard to get perfectly done, uh, really really hard. Real life vanishing points and perspective lines aren't as straight and precise as a 3D model. So don't worry on getting the exact overall scale or position correct here in the 3D software. We're gonna take care of that later in Photoshop. For now, focus on the perspective and vanishing points as best as you can. Then let's just save this scene. Make sure to click Done over the Match Photo tab. And under the Styles tab, we can uncheck the photo so that it disappears and doesn't bother us while setting up other rendering settings. Now look, I'm not gonna make the rendering part a step of this workflow because it really depends on the style and look you're going for. There are many rendering engines that can suit your needs here, and again, if you're going for a realistic approach, each photo will demand specific settings. But an important tip I can give you here, which is a thing you must do, is to match the sun direction. Uh, regardless of the style, if you're planning on having shadows, try to get a close sun position, okay? Making it right won't really take your image to the next level to be honest, but getting it wrong just ruins the composition in my opinion. And second, be sure to work with a high quality render and activate render elements. We've been through these steps over other videos, uh, plus we have a full course on creating architectural images, but you can find it pretty easily with a Google search. Alright, now once the render is ready, we can jump into Photoshop for the third and last step. But before that, let's hear from today's video sponsor, Skillshare. If you don't already know, Skillshare is an online learning community with literally thousands and thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people, where you can explore new skills or practice existing ones. Not only you can watch as many lessons and courses as you like at your own time and pace, but now they have workshops where you can follow a set calendar, engage with like-minded students, and exchange feedback to improve your work. The one class I'm really inspired at the moment is Find Your Style, 5 Exercises to Unlock Your Creative Identity uh, from Andy J. Pizza, uh, where you can go outside of your comfort zone and really get the creativity that you have inside out. And I find it fascinating how you can relate that to architectural style and representation. Now, no matter what 2021 brings us, uh, one of the best investments you can make is in yourself and in your education. And Skillshare might be the most cost-effective thing on the internet for that. It's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription to access all these curated lessons that have no ads and are focused on the learning experience. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my video description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership so that you can explore your creativity. Thanks Skillshare for sponsoring this video, now onto Photoshop. So in a new file, place the base image and then import all of the renders that came out. I usually like to have them in a group so that we can transform, scale and reposition all of them at the same time. Ctrl G with the layers selected to create a group. Lower the group opacity to better see the image below it. And then Ctrl T to transform the group or layer. Don't forget to hold Shift to maintain the proportions and start scaling up or down to match your photo. A great tip here is to have a reference size on the base photo. For example, I know that if I match the site front width, to the building facade width, the building will be properly scaled as a whole. Obviously, this will only work if all those site measurements were done correctly beforehand and the model was precisely done and all those steps that we have to do correct were done correctly, right? So assuming you did everything right, matching two dimensions will make your building up to scale on the base photo. Now you need to know this, as I mentioned that it's hard to get a perspective 100% correct, be prepared to fine tune your match photo tool if needed. It might look pretty close over the 3D model, 
but then when you correctly scale the building, you, you might see some areas that are not that good. Here on YouTube, I try to bring things already solved and planned out uh, so that I don't waste too much of your time. But in reality, creating architectural images is a process that demands going back and forth, testing out and seeing if things work better this or the other way. So I'm gonna quickly go back to SketchUp to try to make the top area here a bit more angled to look more in sync with what's happening on the other buildings. I mean, you cannot really see the top areas here, so we shouldn't see on our project, right? So don't think it's extra work if you need to come back to adjust your perspective lines. It's part of the process to ensure you're getting a good match. Uh, that's why I usually don't start any post-production steps before making sure it's the best match I could get. Now, since uh, your render is all set up, it's just a matter of tweaking the lines, uh, re-render, and import all over again to Photoshop. Uh, if your computer doesn't render that fast, or your settings made your render time heavy and long, uh, do this testing step with a low-quality preview to ensure a faster workflow. Okay, some adjustments were made, and now let me get the renders back to Photoshop. Good. And also keep in mind that some small corrections can be made over Photoshop with the transform tool, in case you need to align verticals and things like that. I like to see the match photo as a solid start so that the overall perspective lines and vanishing points are as close as I can get to the base photo. Then Photoshop solves the rest. And that includes our next move, a masking the building out. You can choose to create this mask over the whole folder or individually on the render. It doesn't really matter because you can move the mask around afterwards. So create a mask and fill with black. I find it easier to reveal only where necessary instead of hiding everything that is not needed. And now with a small round hard brush with white as the color, I start painting the areas that should be visible. A pro tip here is to click once and hold shift to paint in straight lines. To nail this particular insertion, and this goes according to the project, obviously, we need to make as if the sidewalk entered the building on the ground floor. So I'm going to hide the flooring there, uh, so that after we can place the same sidewalk texture there. Are you going to see that in just a moment? Copy and paste from an existing textured area. Apply adjustments to make sure this matches the new location. And mask out where necessary. The shadows have to be recreated here again, and recreating shadows is something that we do pretty often when creating architecture images. Uh, I like to use several layers to get a good result, one layer with a soft light or overlay blend mode to give contrast to the dark area, and another normal layer to darken the shadow as a whole. Again, this applies to my circumstances here, but I'm sure when placing your project, in the drone photo you have, you might have similar things to do. And there you have it. Now your building is pretty much placed and you can go ahead and do the usual post-production steps that you usually do, add textures and people, a fix, stuff, and so on. But keep in mind that you need to add shadows to the surrounding buildings if the project blocks the sun or is too close to cause nearby type of shadow. This step really helps to sell the image better. And now I'm going to speed up the process a bit here because this is not the focus of this video, otherwise I think this would be too long. Again, I'm going to leave a few helpful links in the video description for you to check it out and gather this knowledge if you need to. And, and as always, you can use YouTube's built-in feature in the video player to slow down this video if you want to see it at a normal pace. As always, if you have any questions, oh, please drop them in the comments down below. If you learned something, give this video a like. And if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on future videos. 
I'm really looking forward to 2021. Loads of content planned out for you guys. And thank you so much for the amazing feedbacks that you guys give me. It really encourages me to keep going. So thank you. All right, I'm going to leave you with the last minute here. And we talk over the comment section. Thank you so much for watching. And if you stayed until here, uh, let me ask you a question. Did you notice the banana too that I have on my Photoshop? Do you know what that's for? Anyways, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.